coming up. Finland and Sweden confirm they will apply to join NATO, ending decades of military non-alignment following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The two Nordic countries will start the process this week, with the move expected to redraw the security map of Europe. Calling for cooperation to overcome crisis, President Yoon Suk-yeol will address the National Assembly on Monday to request the quick approval of his government's first COVID-19 spending package, a $46 billion extra budget bill to help small businesses and self-employed workers suffering from the pandemic. Concerns are growing over the reported spread of COVID-19 in North Korea, with state media reporting tens of thousands of cases of unexplained fever over the weekend and a growing death toll. Pyongyang has reportedly asked China for antivirus supplies. Hello and welcome to New Day at Arirang. It's Monday, May 16th, 8 a.m. here in Seoul, South Korea. I'm Lee seung -jae. I'm Oh Seung. Thank you for joining us this morning because over the next hour, we'll be giving you the biggest headlines of the day and experts' insights on some of the key issues facing Korea and the rest of the world. Finland and Sweden have both officially announced they'll seek to join NATO. The announcements come less than three months after Russia invaded Ukraine. That's right, and if they join NATO, it would end decades of military neutrality for the two Nordic nations. Watchers say it's the latest sign of how Moscow's invasion continues to impact security consideration across Europe. Kim il -sun with our top story. The Finnish government has officially announced its intention to join NATO, foregoing their decades-long history of military neutrality and ignoring Russian threats of possible retaliation. We have reached today an important decision in good cooperation between the government and the president of the republic. We hope that the parliament will confirm the decision to apply for NATO membership during the coming days. It will be based on a strong mandate. A formal membership application will be submitted to NATO headquarters in Brussels following approval by the Finnish parliament. The decision risks possible retaliation by Moscow, whose president Vladimir Putin says Saturday that abandoning military neutrality and joining the bloc will be a mistake. The next day, the Finnish president Sauli Niinistö said his latest discussions with Putin did not contain any threats, adding Putin was calm and cool. Just hours after Finland's announcement, Sweden's ruling party followed suit, saying Sweden will also look to join the Western alliance. With this in mind, our conclusion is that as a member of NATO, Sweden will not only achieve more security, but also contribute to more, secu to more security. Within NATO, Sweden will be a security provider. And the Social Democratic Party will, supply, will support an application for NATO membership together with Finland. The head of NATO played down any risks to Swiss membership for the two Nordic countries, adding Turkey has stressed it does not intend to try and block the membership. So my intention is still to have a, a quick and swift uh, uh, process uh, where uh, we uh, will then sit down uh, with Finland and Sweden if they apply agree the accession protocol uh, and then um, uh, hope uh, and work for a very speedy uh, ratification process in the 30 parliaments. NATO membership requires support from all of the current 30 allies, including Turkey, which has accused Finland and Sweden of supporting Kurdish groups. NATO further explained it will take proactive steps to provide Helsinki and Stockholm with extra protection until their membership is finalized. Kim il -san. Arirang News. President Yoon Sogyo will be giving his first policy speech at the National Assembly today. The presidential office said Sunday that his address will focus on the need for bipartisan cooperation to overcome current crises, possibly emphasizing national unity. President Yoon has stressed the importance of unity in everyday politics, as some have pointed out that there was no mention of integration in his inaugural speech last week. The president will be also giving details on an extra budget bill, which was approved at the cabinet meeting last week, worth a record 46 billion US dollars. It's aimed at helping small businesses hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
North Korea reported over 390,000 new suspected cases of COVID-19, or what it calls a fever of an unknown cause on Monday. Eight additional deaths were also reported. Now that's according to the state's National Emergency Quarantine Command Center. Amid escalating infections, the regime leader Kim Jong-un pointed to issues with the supply of previously ordered medication to pharmacies at a Politburo meeting of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea. Meanwhile, in an effort to contain the virus, Pyongyang has reportedly asked Beijing for antivirus supplies. According to sources familiar with North Korea-China relations on Sunday, relevant discussions are underway. China has previously said it will provide assistance immediately upon the North's request. The border between the two countries remains closed to contain the virus, but could reopen for supply shipments. Now, South Korean health authorities have expanded eligibility for oral COVID-19 antiviral drugs. The Central Disaster Management Headquarters says that from Monday, Pfizer's Paxlovid will be used for adults or children 12 years or older with a high risk of developing a severe case due to factors such as underlying diseases. It added Legavrio, the second oral pill approved to treat COVID-19 patients here in South Korea, will be used for adults with underlying medical conditions. Now, previously, these drugs were only given to senior citizens over 60 or those over 40 with underlying illnesses. Now, President Yoon suk yeol took office in South Korea last week with big plans and promises for citizens. However, he can't do everything himself. In fact, the opposition, the Democratic Party of Korea, holds a majority in parliament as well in regional governments. Now, things may change, though, on June 1st as voters here in South Korea head to the polls to elect regional and local leaders. Will President Yoon's party continue its momentum or will the opposing Democratic Party of Korea be able to bounce back from the loss? All right, Kim Do-yeon tells us what this election is about and why it's so important. COVID-19 relief, real estate development, and even taxes. These are some of the areas that not only the president, but also regional governments have powers over in South Korea. On June 1st, Voters will head to the polls to decide on governors or mayors of the 17 provincial governments. And with President Yoon's administration kicking off last week with big plans, the election results will have a huge impact on his five-year term as he will want the backing of regional governments with four-year terms for the winning candidates. On the other hand, the Democratic Party of Korea will be able to redeem themselves following disappointment in the presidential election by taking regional chief posts, such as Hor mayor or governor of Gyeonggi-do province, where they'll be able to influence the country's policies. So who exactly are voters electing? Most voters in South Korea will be voting in seven different elections, from local district council members to regional education superintendents. There are around 4,100 seats up for grabs, and more than 7,600 candidates are running to fill those spots. How are things looking now? Currently, the two largest cities are run by mayors from the president's party, the People Power Party. However, the majority of regional governments are controlled by the Democratic Party of Korea. And the most populous province, Gyeonggi-do's top office, is only vacant, as former Democratic Party of Korea's presidential candidate Lee Jae-myung resigned to run in the presidential race. How much power do regional governments have? The 17 regional leaders especially have enormous impact on the residents of their districts, perhaps the most powerful being in the nation's capital, where the mayor oversees an annual budget of more than 30 billion U.S. dollars and is responsible for around 10 million residents. The Seoul mayor participates in weekly cabinet meetings, and while the position does not include a right to vote, the winning candidate will have a direct channel to the president. What if positions are uncontested? Naturally, with so many posts open for elections, some will go uncontested, meaning the number of candidates is the same as open posts. This time around, nearly 500 positions have been filled without the need for a vote, a five-fold jump since the last local elections four years ago. One explanation for this is that in regions where political preferences have become more distinct, the less popular parties have chosen to opt out. 
Who's eligible to vote? The recent introduction of a new law means the voting age has been lowered to 18 years old. All Koreans over that age are eligible to vote. One thing to note here is that for local elections, foreigners who have been permanent residents for at least three years are also able to participate. They are unable to vote in presidential or general elections. Official campaigning starts on Thursday, and early voting opens on the 27th and 28th of May. Kim Do-yeon, Arirang News. Now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into key issues in the spotlight right now. Now, with most antivirus measures lifted, the health authorities are set to lift even more measures moving forward, including the mandatory seven-day quarantine for infected patients. However, is the country ready to bring in these measures considering the persistently high number of cases, as well as concerns over Omicron subvariants? To get an insight on these issues, we connect with Dr. Alice Tan, internist at Ms. Medi's Women's Hospital. Very good morning to you. Now, first off, health authorities are set to lift more antivirus measures, including mandatory testing and the mandatory seven-day quarantine for infected patients. Now, what do you make of this decision? Well, right now, all of the uh, risk assessment factors are improving in South Korea. We have the number of new cases continue to go down, new admissions are decreasing, new ICU cases are decreasing, and perhaps most importantly, the number of new cases that are age 60 and older is also consistently going down. Now, the only factor here that I think is a red flag is the number of people who are 16 over who have received their fourth dose, so the second booster, is really only at around 24%. So that's the one uh, aspect that I think is, is a little bit worrisome. I do hope that the trajectory continues, even if the testing and quarantine uh, procedures are no longer mandated, that doesn't mean that they're still not good ideas. So I hope that administrators, leaders, uh, employers, stress that to the people who are uh, working for and under them that it's never a good idea to have an infectious person at work or at school. And so if a person has symptoms, they should still get tested. If they have any suspicion or they're a close contact of a positive case, they still need to stay at home. It's just no longer going to be a mandate. But I hope the public uh, maintains good sense and responsibility and they continue to do the right thing. I guess uh, the one person who has been very much against those uh, plans was uh, Yoon's Transition Committee Chief An Cher Su, right, uh, who had criticized the lifting of the measures, uh, saying, you know, it was too early and that decisions should kind of be measured scientifically. So uh, what would be the right move to make at this current state, I guess, based on science then? Uh, Dr. Donna, if you, I guess uh, you didn't hear this once again, let me just repeat the question I can once hear again. You. Okay, so what would be the, the sure. best, uh, st uh, I guess, decision to make based on science, so to speak? Right, so the parameters, parameters that we're looking at are hospital capacity, the amount of protection in the community, especially among the most vulnerable groups, also whether or not uh, we have good and low transmission levels overall. And then the presence of new threats, those would be new variants that might be in the community. Uh, and those are the things that we're looking out for right now. And as I said, um, uh, except for the fact that only 24% of people who are older than 60 have received their fourth dose and perhaps also uh, a low vaccination rate among children, other than those two uh, factors, I think the rest of the country is ready to move on and to continue to lift mitigation levels at this time. And Dr. Tan, there's been a rising number of cases among those 18 years and under. Now, how serious is the situation? Well, if we look at the numbers uh, week by week, you know, as a trend, I think that we can see that even cases that are aged 18 and younger uh, is decreasing overall. Now, May 10th was the peak number of new cases among pediatric population this uh, last week. But if we compare the, f the number from May 10th to one week prior, 
that's actually a thousand cases fewer. And last week's number compared to one week before that is 1,800 cases fewer. So overall, the number of cases in children and adolescents is decreasing. But as I said, less than 2% of children aged 11 and younger have received the first dose of vaccination. And unfortunately on May 14th, mark the death of another uh, child in the pediatric age group that's bringing our number of deaths in this uh, 18 and younger age group to 30 now. And so uh, we do need to be very, very careful. Any diagnosis of COVID in a child, even if it doesn't lead to death, can be devastating. The isolation, they're having to miss school. Uh, these are all things that we need to take into account. Also, uh, children are at risk for long COVID just as adults are. And so um, even though there is a decrease in the number of cases overall, uh, we do need to drive the number of children who are getting COVID, drive that number further down. Uh, right now it's you know still in the thousands and that's simply too many. Yeah, I mean, the uh, misconception at this time is the fact that if you're young and you get COVID, everything is going to be OK. There's no symptoms and so forth. But uh, certainly looking at the numbers, uh, it is very concerning. Uh, Dr. Don, I want to kind of briefly touch upon the recent global uh, COVID-19 summit. Uh, obviously, world leaders are you know, pledging to assist in tackling the ongoing pandemic. As a doctor, what do you think is needed most right now to help fight the prolonged uh, pandemic? Right, so the Global Health Summit that was held on May 12th, uh, the main outcomes were to try to prevent uh, prevent the uh, complacency that we're seeing in many parts of the world regarding the pandemic, stressing that the pandemic is still not over. We also want to protect the most vulnerable members of the global community, that would be the elderly and frontline healthcare workers. And then we also want to prevent, of course, future catastrophes, another wave, or another pandemic. I think the most important thing right now is to turn vaccines into vaccinations. And we can do that by making sure that vaccines are available, that they are accessible, and that they are attractive. In other words, we need to continue to convince people who may be hesitant uh, that they do need to get vaccinated. And this is actually proving to be very difficult, but this involves a strong information and communications campaign, making sure that we use community ambassadors to get the message across, make sure we engage the public, listen to their concerns and address their concerns and convince everyone that the benefits far outweigh the risk of vaccination. And we really do need to vaccinate everyone in every corner of this world in order to get over this pandemic. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Alice Tan, for your insights. We'll speak to you again next week. Thank you. And with that, that's going to wrap up part one of New Day at Arirang. But do stick around because we have more coming your way. We'll be back after a brief moment. Now, the global economy is expected to improve slightly this year. It's going to drop, but future economic, future economic indicators weren't so positive. Faster growth in emerging the US China trade deal may be near, while a rally in global equity. For an economic outlook of South Korea's economy for 2020, we get a preview now from our business correspondent. Arirang, what matters?
it's time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. With President Yoon Seo-go having been in office for almost a week now, we've seen his diplomatic pledges start to turn into policy. Now, Yoon has called for a greater role for South Korea in the world, and he's emphasised this throughout his inauguration speech last week, after which he greeted foreign dignitaries at the ceremony and then attended his first diplomatic event, the US-led COVID-19 summit online. Now, today we discuss how South Korea under Yoon will broaden its role in the world and address some of the biggest geopolitical issues in the region. For this, we're joined by Song Taeryeon, Professor of Law at Kyungyi University in Seoul, and Ramon Pacheco Pardo, Head of International Relations at King's College London. Very warm welcome to you both. And, well, beginning with you, Professor Song. Now, last week, we saw President Yoon engage with foreign dignitaries and take part in this first online summit event with other government leaders. So, what were your takeaways from Yoon's first diplomatic steps as president? Well, as expected, the uh, UN administration as a conservative administration is expected to align more with the U.S. and, and be more active in the regional and global issues. Uh, that means becoming more positive about forming a uh, trilateral security alliance in the region, uh, along with the U.S. and Japan, uh, maybe even open to joining the Quad if uh, uh, invited, uh, and also making clearer stance on human rights and other controversial issues, uh, especially uh, with China, and uh, be more principled, rule-based uh, in dealing with North Korea and so on and so forth. So I, I think those are the things that uh, uh, are expected and the, the changes that will make uh, happen uh, as a, opposed to the, the previous administration. Uh, I, I think that those will be the, also the issues that the Joe Biden and President Yoon will talk about uh, next week. And Professor Pacheco Pardo, same question to you, really. Uh, your takeaway on uh, Yoon's first diplomatic steps last week and how they really set the tone for what he's going to do in the short and long run in launching Korea as a pivotal state in the world. Well, well, I think South Korea is going to be asked uh, to attend more of these uh, meetings, uh, multilateral meetings, minilateral meetings, uh, and to have a voice. Uh, we saw it with the recent COVID-19 uh, discussion uh, that you mentioned. We saw it also with the Summit for Democracy that took place, for example, last December under, under President Moon. Uh, so I would expect the current president, President Yoon, uh, to become an active voice uh, in these forums. Uh, and I think that he will present a Korean perspective uh, of global affairs, which of course uh, may be different from the perspective that we may have in Europe, for example, but that uh, will be welcome because I think in terms of uh, values, uh, uh, Korea is quite close to, to the US, uh, to Europe, to other democracies. So even though the perspective might be different, there's also going to be a degree of alignment uh, with these other democracies in my view. Professor Song, um, Yun emphasised the value of freedom in his inaugural speech, mentioning it 35 times, and he obviously used mm -hmm. it very liberally uh, in order to indicate his approach to uh, both domestic and international issues facing Korea, from overcoming social and economic inequality to protecting liberal democracy abroad. Now, how active and how vocal do you think Yun is going to be in promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific? It shows, I think, his fundamental value tilted towards a uh, market mechanism, but also shows his philosophy regarding the role of government. Uh, you know, modern politics is about the mix of invisible hand, market mechanism, and the visible hand, uh, the government's role. Uh, he has a fundamental problem with the previous administration in how those were apportioned. Uh, same thing with the... Uh, 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 with the global affairs, I think he would advocate the rule-based free trade-based uh, system with a multilateral framework of safeguarding security and democratic values. Uh, I think the, the, he seeks to be uh, in partner with U.S. and other, uh, other nations in the, in the region uh, to be uh, active players uh, going forward. I, I think that domestic matters and the, the, the foreign affairs kind of uh, come together in his philosophy and his directions and policies. And Professor Pacheco Pardo, now with the Moon administration, the focus of Seoul's foreign policy was very much um, 
peninsula focused with uh, former President Moon's priority being inter-Korean peace and diplomacy alongside denuclearization efforts, of course. But for Moon, it seems that he's focusing more on international values like liberal democracy and human rights and, and applying that to North Korea as well. So how do you think Yoon is going to approach engagement with Pyongyang? Well, we have seen that the first opportunity has uh, arisen with the COVID-19 situation in, in North Korea, or North Korea at least acknowledging uh, the gravity of the situation uh, domestically. Uh, I, I should say that I, I was expecting President Yoon to take any opportunity for engagement with North Korea and try to see what happens. Uh, and this opportunity has come very early uh, in his presidency. Uh, so I'm not surprised that uh, he's advocating for South Korea to offer uh, vaccines and cooperation uh, with North Korea. Uh, I do think, though, that North Korea uh, launches uh, an ICBM, for example, or even conducts a nuclear test because they have been some preparations in recent weeks, that he will take uh, a tough approach. Uh, he will be pretty critical uh, towards North Korea. And I do think that he will mention human rights issues, for example, more often than the previous administration. But I think in terms of trying to engage with North Korea, I'm not surprised that he will try to do so because at the end of the day, if he can improve inter-Korean relations, he would go down in history, have one of the presidents uh, helping uh, to improve relations between the two Koreas. And ultimately, that's something that President Yoon uh, would like to achieve, if possible, of course. And your thoughts on this, Professor Song. How would uh, Yoon Sagar incorporate values like human rights and freedom into his North Korea policy? I think that uh, it goes back to the basics of human rights uh, are universal values. There shouldn't be any uh, North Korea-specific uh, human rights situation. So uh, this is a principle of uh, Vienna Declaration, uh, a very important uh, principle uh, in, in human rights. I, I think the UN administration will eschew exceptionalism that the Moon government seem to have carved out for North Korea and go back to the principle of the rule-based approach when it comes to uh, North Korean uh, human rights and dealings. And th that doesn't necessarily mean that he will be antagonistic towards North Korea through and through. Uh, I think he will believe uh, free trade and economic growth uh, will pave the way for the political freedom and the hum uh, better human rights. So he would be open uh, to working with North Korea economically, but that has to be based on the assurance of peace and the, the abiding by the, the global principles. And Professor Patrick Pade, well, um, Yoon said that he had an audacious economic plan for North Korea should Pyongyang make a sincere commitment to denuclearizing. What do you think he has in mind exactly? Well, I do think that he would be willing to offer a comprehensive economic package to help improve the infrastructure of North Korea that, we, as we know, uh, is very underdeveloped uh, by the standards of, of, of the region of Northeast Asia. Uh, I think uh, he would be willing to offer uh, food aid uh, and other type of support, for example, medical aid to ordinary uh, North Koreans. Uh, and I do think that uh, he would be willing to ask for exemptions to the sanctions regime currently imposed on North Korea to try to uh, improve the economic well-being of uh, ordinary uh, North Koreans. So, so I do think that he has, or seems to have, a very comprehensive uh, package. Of course, this is predicated on North Korea changing its behavior dramatically. Uh, but I do think that he sees the benefits not only for North Korea, but also for South Korean companies and the South Korean economy of uh, better economic relations uh, between the two Koreas. And Professor Pacheco Pardo, it does seem that the UN administration is trying to look beyond uh, the Korean Peninsula, and this is very much in tune with uh, the title of your book, really, um, being released very, very soon. But as well, with South Korea aiming to play a more sizable role in the world, in what ways do you hope to see the UN uh, administration really expanding Seoul's role and engaging in world diplomacy? I think there are three main issues here. First of all, working with allies and partners. Uh, and of course, uh, there are partners in, in, in Northeast Asia, right? The US, Japan, uh, trilateral together with uh, South Korea. 
other partners in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Australia, for example, uh, the Quad uh, uh, as a whole, uh, and then, of course, partners beyond the region, for example, in, in, in Europe, uh, Canada, another country that is very willing to cooperate with uh, South Korea. Uh, the second point, I think we would expect an increase in aid uh, provided by South Korea to developing countries. It is true that South Korea is one of the most recent donors uh, at the global level, but I think there's expectation that it will help in more uh, poorer countries in, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, for example. Uh, and finally, something that I referred to uh, before, uh, and distinctly South Korea, uh, that is going to be based on, on values, of course, democracy, but that is going to uh, show to the rest of the world where South Korea stands today, which is a developed country, a full democracy, uh, a market economy that has a very interesting view of global affairs that may be different from other countries. Well, we apologise for the slight technical hiccup there. And well, uh, Professor Song, what kind of role do you think South Korea could play to promote liberal democracy and human rights in the world, as Yun said he would? As the professor mentioned, Korea is a, a middle power country that has successfully gone through industrialization and democratization, along with the development of soft power uh, culturally. I, I think the, our insights uh, gained from that process will be relevant to any countries, many countries in the world, especially those that are trying to build foundations and institutions for sustainable society. So uh, as we uh, uh, try to you know, increase our voice, and especially working with uh, allies, especially the U.S. and uh, Western countries and, and other countries in the region, uh, probably we'll be able to contribute uh, with the, the institutions and also insights so that the, 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 what we hope for globally, the uh, solving of uh, our urgent problems, and also build a, a sustainable, uh, peace-based, and prosperous uh, uh, future, probably that will be much more uh, easily achieved if Korea uh, resolve and also be more active in the global stage. Um, Professor Song, uh, this upcoming South Korea-U.S. summit uh, with President Joe Biden expected to visit. So um, what do you expect to top the agenda for the two leaders when they meet? Well, I, I think that because uh, North Korea ha has uh, recent provocations, that should be very short term and very urgent uh, discussions. But as we're discussing uh, in this occasion, uh, what kind of role uh, uh, Korea could play in the region uh, and also globally, I, I think that would be an important agenda uh, going forward. And also, I think that on a personal level, the uh, uh, President Biden and uh, uh, President Yoon uh, should be uh, very familiar with each other going forward in order to make a lot of uh, ideas and visions uh, into uh, reality uh, because the personal relationship, uh, I, I think, counts a lot in dealing with those uh, very sensitive and very important issues in the world. Well, I'm afraid this is where we're going to have to wrap up the interview today. That was Hong Tae Ryong, Professor of Law at Kyung Yee University in Seoul, and Ramon Pacheco Pardo, Head of International Relations at King's College London. Thank you both so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the weekend-long K-pop music festival, K-pop Flex, wrapped up on Sunday at the Deutsche Bank Park Stadium in Frankfurt, Germany, where the two-day event marked the largest K-pop festival ever held in Europe. Now, the festival saw all 44,000 seats sold on the first day, with 30,000 more attending the event on day two. Now, the festival featured many of K-pop's top acts, including N-Hypen, Mamamoo, and NCT Dream. Now, speaking of idols, BTS, Blackpink, and many other K-pop stars continue to sweep the global charts and expand their own international fandom. Yet, these idols haven't just appeared out of nowhere. From the very first generation to the well-known acts of today, the K-pop idol genealogy has expanded. For today's Arirang News Features segment, our Kim bo -kyung takes a look at how K-pop has developed its own genealogy. 
Korean idols. It is no exaggeration to call them the very center of K-pop. Fans find not only joy but also comfort from listening to their songs and buying their merchandise. What kind of idols do you like? I like Woozy. 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 무대를 하면서 웃고 행복해하는 모습을 보면서 아, 나도 저렇게 하고 싶은 일을 하면서 행복하고 싶다라는 느낌을 받는 팬들이 많은 것 같아요. 저도 그래서 좋아하는 것 같고. Ever since the genre emerged, K-pop has been quickly broadening its boundaries, and as the world experiences distinctive features, its infectious charm and choreography, it is no longer seen as a niche genre or subculture, but rather a genre for listeners around the world to enjoy. With idol groups present for many years, people started to divide them into generations. Experts usually say that K-pop genealogy can be traced back to the mid-1990s. And although a line cannot be clearly drawn, the representative groups for each generation changed every 5 to 10 years. From the groups that spurred on the very beginning of the K-pop wave to the most recent idols in the so-called fourth generation, Let's dig deeper into the K-pop scene for each generation. The mid to late 1990s saw the arrival of K-pop's first generation of stars. Influenced by the groups Hoteji and Boys, SM Entertainment's HOT and SCS along with DSP Media's Finkel and Juxkiss paved the way for artists to come up with Korea's own dance and hip-hop music. We could say this was a so-called K-pop test period without a proper management system or agencies. With no system in place, individual producers brought ideas rather than know-how to create the environment. Izuman played a key role, and thanks to him, other producers emerged too. The reigning aesthetic during this generation was dubbed African-American-style hip-hop music, on top of which other experimental music could be added. After the first generation, the grand renaissance of the K-pop industry came. The mid-2000s to the early 2010s could be considered the time when numerous pioneering acts helped shape today's global K-pop industry and the Hollywood wave that followed. Among them were TVXQ, Super Junior, Girls' Generation, Shiny, 21, Wonder Girls, and so on. Addictive, captivating melodies and choreography perfectly in sync all of them fully supported by big entertainment production agencies. It was enough to broaden the fandom boundaries. Both first- and second-generation K-pop idol groups addressed similar themes in their music. Boy groups would complain about the education system, while girl groups would talk about mellow and soft love stories. However, the biggest difference between the first- and the second generations was the potential to expand the stardom in the global market. First generation idol such as HOT or like SES, Jackskiss, although some of them made some international success in, let's say, China or other parts of some East Asia, but uh, basically th they and their entertainment agency did not really think the international market as the very important part for their career. They were basically the local musician making music for the local audience just like, I mean, the Korean audience. But since the second generation, they now found the very possibility of like their music becoming globally successful. So because of, you know, the Hallyu history, the, because of the success of the other Hallyu product such as Korean TV series or Korean films. So the second generation idol and their entertainment agency thought like more seriously that they could be the international star. But Still, however, the popularity of these groups remained within Asian borders, with Korean idols sweeping the charts mainly in East Asian countries such as China, Hong Kong, and Japan. That is until a major boom turned the tide. The third generation of idols made their debuts in the early 2010s. BTS finally sprang on the scene and brought worldwide attention to the K-pop industry and pushed K-pop beyond Asian countries. BTS, TWICE, BLACKPINK, and MAMAMOO are the most well-known acts to come from this crop of artists, and their music styles have become more diverse as they are no longer just targeting local listeners. The messages shared in their songs also started to change, telling their fans how important it is to love themselves and encouraging listeners to be courageous.
the messages found in the lyrics was not the only change. How music is released, the length of albums, and even the way K-pop groups are promoted became very different through the years resulting in a heavier workload for idols in a constant cycle of releasing and promoting new music. Basically, first and second generation idols would have to do a lot of promotion right up to and after the release of their follow-up song, which usually came a month after an album was released. But as time passed, the number of songs on a full-length album went down from 10 to 5 or 6 songs, and idols started to release more singles or so-called EP mini-albums. Because the number of idols increased so much, they constantly had to promote their music, which meant shortening the gap between performances and album releases and appearing more often with singles. Amid fierce competition among the large number of acts, not all lighter groups got the chance to showcase their talents on major broadcasters. This made them use more diverse channels to promote themselves and come up with their own unique content. YouTube was the easiest platform to do that, and over-the-top services, including Netflix, was another method used to reach fans. Algorithms led fans of one K-pop act to other K-pop groups, creating a ripple effect that ensured fans around the world to keep a close eye on K-pop idols and the industry. Against this backdrop, the fourth generation arrived. In the early 2020s, new idol groups such as ITZY, IVE, G-IDOL, TXT, ESPA, and n were unveiled. Thanks to BTS, who've paved the way for idols to shine in global music market, fourth generation idols now consider themselves as global artists with international audience in mind with everything they do. They are thinking about their identity as actually the global or the international pop star rather than only limited in local uh, market. Uh, and they also know that even before making their debut, that they can get a chance to be known to the international audience. K-pop is becoming really global kind of genre, which means that there are a lot more fans who are waiting for new music, new artists, which means that they are subscribing the news site about the K-pop, who will make their debut in this month or late next month, and from which uh, entertainment agency. Now with solid fandom and a concrete music base, idols are expanding musical diversity even more, from just dance music that was a major genre to more experimental genres. This is more apparent now, as many idols have their own professional composers among group members, like for example, Jeon Soyeon in G-Idol and bands now incorporate their own unique style rather than following what producers from agencies want them to be like. X are also exploring totally new concepts like Espa, whose group identity is connected to avatars in the digital space so that each member can appear virtually in music videos and performances. From the first generation to the fourth, with the passage of time, the representative idol groups that swept the charts and enjoyed popularity have changed. Yet, K-pop idols, a major part of an overhaul in Korea's arts and entertainment sector, have consistently expanded their influence from the beginning. Now that K-pop is receiving worldwide attention from global fans, it won't come as a surprise to see more global superstars like BTS continuing that success. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Turning to the US on Saturday, where an 18-year-old gunman shot and killed 10 people and wounded three others at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. Following the attack, the suspect surrendered in what authorities are calling a hate crime. The perpetrator had armed himself with an assault-style rifle and traveled several hours to the store in a predominantly black community. Reports indicate that 11 of the 13 people shot were black, while two were white. Speaking on Sunday, President Joe Biden urged Americans to, quote, work together to address the hate that remains a stain on the soul of America. Vice President Kamala Harris, meanwhile, denounced the epidemic of hate across the nation. In Japan on Sunday, hundreds of protesters came from across the country for rallies in Okinawa, demanding a reduction of U.S. military forces on the island on the 50th anniversary of Okinawa's return to Japan, following 27 years of U.S. rule. In Naha City, more than 1,000 people from Tokyo, Hiroshima, Nagasaki and Okinawa held an indoor gathering. 
protesters said that military bases have been strengthened instead of reduced, and suggested that their presence is not intended to protect Japanese citizens, but instead part of U.S. military strategy. Citing incidents and crimes committed by U.S. troops in the region, residents countered that their presence makes the prefecture more dangerous. Shanghai will slowly reopen shopping malls and hair salons from Monday following a strict six-week COVID-19 lockdown, according to the city's vice mayor on Sunday. Shopping malls, department stores and supermarkets will resume business, allowing customers to shop in a, quote, orderly way. Hair salons and vegetable markets will also reopen with limited capacity. This comes as residents during lockdown were limited to purchasing necessities, with normal shopping on online platforms mostly suspended. According to a city official, Shanghai will also announce a third whitelist soon, allowing more than 820 import and export companies to resume operations. In Turin on Sunday, Ukraine's Kalush Orchestra were crowned winners at the 2022 Eurovision Song Contest. Sitting in fourth place, following jury votes, the rap folk band surged to the top of the leaderboard following the announcement of the results of the public vote. Speaking at the first news conference after the win, the group's frontman said the victory was important for Ukraine. The band's song Stefania, sung in Ukrainian, is a fusion of rap and traditional folk music. It is also the third time that Ukraine has won the annual competition. The streets of London saw the inaugural race of the e-scooter championship on Saturday. The 12-turn, 470-meter course built in the Surrey Keys area saw 30 riders across 10 teams participate in a series of 10-minute six-rider knockout races. Switzerland's Matisse Neyrod powered his electric scooter to first place, followed by Britain's Dan Brooks and Indian rider Anish Shetty. The e-scooter machines weigh roughly 40 kilograms and feature two 6-kilowatt motors and can reach top speeds above 100 kilometers per hour. More races are slated for Switzerland, Italy, France, Spain and the United States, with Asia and Africa likely to be added from next season. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good morning. We had some picture-perfect weather on Sunday with clear blue skies, though it was a bit windy weekend. Well, this morning feels chilly without a jacket on, but highs will quickly rise into the 20s. A dry advisory has been issued in the capital and parts of southern provinces. In mountainous regions in Kangwondo province will see strong winds, so please be careful with anything that could start a fire. Morning lows are similar to the same time yesterday in most areas under sunny skies, and strong UV rays will beam down on us all day today. Highs will be 1 to 3 degrees higher, so Busan will be topping out at 23 degrees, Jeju at just 21 degrees. Air quality will be normal to good nationwide. A fine day for an afternoon stroll, but you will need some protective items. It's going to get warmer as the week goes on under mostly sunny skies, so the air will only get drier, so fire precautionary measures are a must. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. And that wraps up our newscast for this morning, but we'll be back tomorrow for our Tuesday's edition of New Day at Arirang. Thanks ever so much for starting your week with us, but do stick around for more updates throughout the day. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Goodbye.